From a closet, also known as the Jim McCarthy VoiceOvers World Headquarters Studio, this is the JMVO Weekly Primer. Please subscribe, rate, and comment via JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com forward slash podcast. Yes, this is the JMVO Weekly Primer. We are getting underway on a Sunday. It is Palindrome Day, the first in 909 years where you can actually take the numbers of today, 020202, or no, 20202. I can't. I may be on it. I've been reading about it. Maybe it doesn't make sense because it's 20. No, it's nine. No, I can't. I don't even know what they did. Anyway, so this is the podcast where you come to marinate your mind in good stuff. You know, as business owners, as voiceover people, as creatives, it is just enough to keep your head out of the negativity. And as voiceover people, it's tough because, uh, you know, especially new people to to the grind, uh, keeping your head out of the um, the elitism that happens and all the different uh, things that happen there that kind of um, squash your game in a, in a way. But uh, again, the JMVO Weekly Primer is all about marinating and mining good stuff. Thanks for uh, hopping aboard today. Um, if you're not a part of the Blue Collar VoiceOver Association group, uh, it's not, I don't think it's going to be something that's just for voiceover people. I mean, um, a lot of the things we'll talk about in there um, are about things like networking, selling, uh, some audio production tips and tricks and things like that. But uh, I think in all the creative arts, you're going to see a lot of, you know, rate shaming and things of that nature. And people are just kind of getting tired of it. We'll address a lot of that and uh, just talk about how to grind it out in a blue collar nature where it's all about the client a lot less about you as a uh, performer or a creative and it, at the end it's all about them giving your client your direct client uh, more value over time um, one of the things that came up this week i took a picture of my networking group i belong to a local chapter of bni and i said how do you network you know do you go to chamber events Rotary functions, Lions clubs, any of that kind of stuff. B and I. How do you guys network? Is it strictly online? Is it through LinkedIn? What kind of hand-to-hand combat? Pardon me. Are you are you engaging in? And it's really something to to think about because. I'm a firm believer if that you if you don't ask the question, the answer will always be no. And you never know who you're really going to meet. You know, that, that goes for online and in person. In person, it's a little bit more effective because you can engage a little bit better, be more them-centric. Because um, I, I, I'm actually an admin on a lot of different pages, one of which is kind of high profile. And I see a lot of the emails that this particular um, public figure gets. And you'd be surprised how many people will take a swing at an opportunity without any sort of value statement for my pal. And, uh, hey, you know, if you ever need this, photography or graphic design, hit me up and let me know. Oh, okay. He's got a tremendous network of people who do that. You know, why would he all of a sudden just pick you? You know, what's in it for him? Why is he going to vouch for you if he doesn't know you? I get this from realtors all the time. All of a sudden, a lot of us have got have gotten this. Where all of a sudden you get connected on LinkedIn or Facebook, and they reach out to you with a DM or a message saying, "Hey, if you know anybody that's getting ready to sell their house, let me know." Now, in our neck of the woods in Nashville, Tennessee, I want to say last year there were forty-one thousand homes sold in Middle Tennessee, uh, up from something like thirty-seven or thirty-eight thousand. And I only, I only know this because I, one of the podcasts I produce is the talk of Music City Real Estate, you should look it up, uh, talked about how from 2018 to 2019, though that was the increase in numbers, pretty good increase. That means there are a lot, of more, lot more realtors out there selling real estate. It's a hot market. It's a, it's a good market to be in right now. And it seems like everybody and their mother is a real estate agent. So they reach out occasionally. Um, I mean, myself, I've got my guy that I would always go to because uh, he, I've done work for him 
for several years, uh, I've, and he's a, he's immensely loyal to me. So when it comes time for us to sell our house, sorry guys, sorry realtors, we're going to go with my guy. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, so when you're reaching out to people blindly like that, you got to have something for them. You got to make sure that you have a value. You know what? What is it? You, not, and and just going for the jugular may not be the way to go. Maybe just saying, "Hey, can I grab a, a drink with you, a coffee?" I'm just be honest and say, "Look, I, I I get it. This is networking. I'm trying to increase my uh, my network. I may not be your guy, but maybe I'm a good match for somebody you know. You know, you never know what an interaction may produce, but it's got to be value centric. It's got to be them centric. It's what is, what is in it for them. So when you look at things like that." And it kind of goes, it doesn't go against what I'm saying that, you know, the answer, the question that you ask will, if you don't ask it, will always, the answer will always be no. There's got to be a tactful, strategic way. And in hand to hand combat marketing, like in person networking, you can really dig down and use those two ears to um, start an uncovery process of sorts. A lot of people think that getting in front of people and selling is eviscerating oneself and data dumping. When in fact, it's fact finding. It's it's quite the opposite. You know, when I when I sold cars, uh, one of the things that I really got into, and there was a a fella that I worked with named Greg Miles. Did I just say fella? <laughs> there was this old chap that I used to work with. Anyway, if Greg is watching, I hope uh, you know. I, I learned this from you. I learned it by watching you, Greg. But he had a brilliant way of engaging customers when they walked through the door. And if he uh, had the opportunity to up them, he would say, hey, welcome to Mercedes Benz. Um, how can I help you today? And they say, well, we're looking at uh, for an SUV. Okay, great. What research have you done so far online? Man, what a great opening line. I mean, just, hey, I know you've done research. Tell me about what you know already and what really kind of pushes your buttons. It's not about what I know. It's about what you already know and how I can add to that and qualify that. I want to hear about your pains. I want to hear about what uh, problems you have, what you didn't like about your, your trade-in, what you do like about it, what you want to keep, what you don't want, that kind of thing. You know, do you like light or dark colors? Uh, a lot of those different questions in a creative sense. If you think about it, in a public networking, uh, not public, but, you know, in-person networking situation, how do you engage people when they come up to you and someone asks you, so what do you do? Did you ever really think about the way you answer that question? Well, I'm a photographer. Well, I'm a graphic designer. I'm a voiceover artist. Voiceover in itself, to say that, is intriguing to engage further conversation. Conversation. Uh, when it comes to photography, videography, graphic design, and this is in my opinion, there tends to be a little bit of, uh, oh, okay, you know, I kind of get what you're saying, and, you know, you probably draw pretty pictures for a living and come up with logos and things of that nature. So I kind of get what you're doing, and the, and the conversation kind of dies there. If you were to come out of the box and say, you know, I make a business look better than it already is, that's what I believe. I believe in finding ways to make your business more appealing to the eye. You know, photographers can do that. Videographers can do that. Voiceover people, I say, you know, one of the things I tell people all the time, well, I make your business sound better. Oh, that's kind of interesting. How do you do that? I do that through voiceover and uh, other ways, either producing radio ads or some sort of content, and I help you make your business sound better. Uh, and I also find a way to succinctly say what it is that you do. Because a lot of people, a lot of business owners get inside their own <laughs> Corey Disson. I'm doing this on video in case you're uh, listening to this. I do these things live and then I put the video up. And if you want to listen, you can always listen. So Corey Disson, he's popping in with saying, I tell people I'm Ray Donovan. Well, that's one way to do it. Ray Donovan. You know, with uh, all sorts of lingo that they use on that show. So what do you tell them? What's the thing you're coming out of the, out of the gate with and telling them, you know, how you do, what do you do? What do you believe about what you do? That's a great question to kind of think about. 
doesn't need to be answered right now, but anybody watching or listening, what do you believe about what you do? Do you enjoy what you do? Have you really figured out why you do it? And I know it goes along the lines of find your why and tell people your why. But you got to feel that. You got to understand what you believe about what you do. That will speak so much stronger and you'll win so many more hearts over time with network, networking, hand-to-hand -hand combat networking, in-person networking. Some of the things that came up in the conversation, um, there were people that just didn't want to talk about um, B&I and how there's a commitment to it. Yeah, there is a commitment to it. There's, you got to pay to be there, um, but visiting is free. So if there's a B&I chapter, excuse me, in your neck of the woods, look them up and visit all the chapters because you're going to be able to, excuse me, bring a step. Uh, I am like belching here and it's awful and I, I get it, but this is real time warts and all. You're going to be able to bring a stack of your business cards and you're going to be able to network openly with people, the members and other visitors uh, for the first 10 or 15 or maybe 20 minutes before the meeting starts. You'll see how the meeting operates. It's about an hour and a half, and there is a procedure that they go through where each of the members of the chapter get to stand up for 30, 45, or maybe 60 seconds and give a commercial about their business. And you'll notice a trend with all the members who understand the nature of the group. They will explain to the, to the group what they're looking for or who they're looking for. And the notion is to be more specific your ask, the more terrific your results are going to be. So specific is terrific. Meaning, I am looking for John Smith because I found him on LinkedIn and he seems to know a lot about finance and he would be a good candidate for a podcast because he's sharing a lot of content. I see some of the videos that he's doing. So if there's anybody in the group that may know someone or know john smith personally uh, a warm introduction would be a great thing for me so that is something to to consider even when you're if someone's asking what you're looking for more specific think about it like google if you put in jewelry stores yeah you'll get a big swath of jewelry stores but if you put in jewelry stores diamond rings and maybe you'll get the, the jewelry stores that are more focused on diamond rings that kind of thing so you'll go through the meeting and then it'll be your turn as a guest to get up and stand and talk to the rest of the group. And you'll be able to ask, tell people what you do. Typically, you won't be able to step on another member's toes. So if you do something that they do, uh, it's probably, it's kind of frowned upon if you try and posture yourself as somebody that can do it better than the member. So just kind of be wary of that. And you can find out what seats are in because they're all very seat specific uh, groups, meaning you can lock out your competition. But uh, not trying to sell anything here, John. I'm just basically uh, explaining what, how I network and how I do it. Um, in Chambers, the same thing. Chambers is a little bit more of an open situation where you can go up to anybody, strike up a conversation. And a lot of people are business owners. This is for the voiceover people, the creatives that are in the group here. If you are in an open networking situation, there are a lot of people in there that could use what you do, believe it or not. A lot of them may have a phone system. And they may have hold music that doesn't say anything. That's an opportunity for you. To open that, you know, if, they, if you open that, you, I make businesses sound better. That kind of a line. Oh, okay, well, how can you make my business sound better? Well, do you have an on hold messaging system? Do you have a phone system? Do you advertise on the radio? Do you advertise on the internet? Do you advertise in podcasts? Oh, I didn't realize that was a thing. Oh, yeah, it's becoming a thing. And I could actually produce a lot of what you need for whatever you're doing in terms of audio. Or if you're in video, same thing. So just stuff to keep in mind that 
you never know who you're going to meet because one of the people you meet might be a phone system vendor. Now, there is a goose that will lay the golden egg because if you partner with somebody like that and they can rely on you to produce messages on hold, IVR, uh, auto attendant messages, things of that nature, they can feed you business. And I've done that with several vendors around town here in Nashville that give me business. And a lot of my business derives from reading phone scripts. Um, and that's okay. It's a good way to make a living and make a friend in for voiceover for newbies that are getting in. That is an excellent way to get involved. You never know. My point is that you'll never know who you're going to meet at one of these networking events. Another thing to consider is how are you presenting yourself? Are you wearing branded clothing, a name tag with your brand on it, something to strike up conversation, something that is an icebreaker of sorts? Because that kind of stuff can really go a long way in the line at Costco or Publix or the, whatever, wherever you shop. If you're wearing a name tag or you've got your, your name on your, uh, your shirt, you know, typically I wear the, the JMVO t-shirts and stuff out. My wife wears them, and they see that brand. Oh, what is JMVO? Oh, Jim McCarthy voiceovers. Oh, you do voiceovers? And typically the next question is, I always was told I could be a voiceover talent. How do I do that? Well, here's my card. Let's talk. You never know who you'll meet. <clears throat> and, you know, the more you're seen out and doing things, the more you're productive you feel, the more creative you're going to feel, the more activity. If you don't have anything else going on, start local. Start in your own backyard. Start in person. It doesn't always have to be online. But if, it, if you want it to be online, you got to make sure you got that value statement to come out of the, out of the box with. Now I'm going to uh, pivot here and talk about failure. That's a fun topic, huh? But I wrote, out, wrote down a few things about failure. It's been something that I've been wanting to talk about. If you look on social media today, at any given moment, everybody, it seems, is living their best life. My gosh, it is just ripe. It, it is everywhere, it seems, that everybody is living their best life, right? How does that make you feel? It feels like you're, you're failing. Because, you know, sometimes I'll be honest. I don't feel like I'm, I'm living my best life when I see other people doing what they're doing. And, uh... Then I got to remind myself that a lot of it is a veneer. It's inauthentic. It's not real. And one thing I promise you is that if it isn't something I've done or tried or believe in, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to endorse it. If I haven't done it, I'm not going to tell you I'm a monster. I'm debating whether or not I can even apply that moniker to myself as of late. I may even pull it down off of my uh, profile descriptions, whether I'm an entrepreneur or not. Because honestly, I'm four years in. I'm being an entrepreneur is not what it's cracked up to be. How people talk about it. It is tough work. And for what I'm doing, I, I, in the beginning, I said yes to a lot of things. Because my journey, well, one of the instances of my journey as an entrepreneur was catalyzed by being fired from a phone system company, of all things, here locally. And I still do work for them. We're still good partners. But I was fired and I had enough working for other people. And I said, to hell with it. I'm going to go and make something for us. And I went home and I told my wife, we're going to live life on our terms for once. We're not going to ask when we can go on vacation or how much we can make. We're going to be able to do things more on our terms. I think I can pull it off this time. And I'm, by this time, I'll go back and rewind. When I was a small boy, no, my upbringing, and this is kind of getting into the topic of failure. I'm going to get really real with you. My upbringing was a good one. I had two very loving, very um, somewhat strict parents that put us on the uh, straight and narrow. Uh, back then, it was expected of us to go to college. And to, to be honest with you, um, not so much from them, but I think more in the high school, middle school part of my life. They, it, it was something that was expected, that you were just going to go to college. And the stigma 
that was programmed and conditioned into our heads was that if you didn't go to college, that was it. Good luck. You were going to be a failure. Even the kids in middle school, ninth grade, they would move up to uh, John Abbott Technical School and start learning cra- uh, trades. And there was a school in Danbury, Connecticut that acted as a, a high school uh, that, that, that got kids ready to go out into the trades, whether they wanted to be a plumber, an electrician, uh, getting into printing, anything like that. Looking back on it, great concept. But let me tell you about the perception the kids that went to Abbott Tech had from the high school kids that I hung around with. We all kind of looked at each other and were like, yeah, they're not college material. That means uh, they got the big old L on their, on their forehead. They're not as good as we are, right? So when you have that beaten your head over the course of your impressionable years, five or six years or so, guidance counselors, teachers, going to SAT examinations and things of that nature. My brother, um, getting back to my upbringing, my brother was kind of the... I kind of felt like I lived in his shadow a lot of my youth because he was the, the kid who did everything seemingly right. He played a musical instrument. He was a part of extracurricular activities. He was in the band. Uh, he went on scholastic trips. He was part of uh, um, junior achievement and, thing, and groups like that. So I didn't do a lot of that stuff. I don't think I did any of it. I was just, I think, the kid that my parents were just like, well, let's get him to 18, make sure that he graduates. If he wants to go to college, fine, we'll pay for it, but we're not exactly expecting great things. Um, That was just, and I'm not being a pity party here. This is just something that I've had, and I don't blame my parents. I sympathize with them, actually, because being a parent's tough. You know, there are times where you just probably want, I just want to get them to 18 and, and make sure that they don't, they don't die. <laughs> and as parents, a lot of us could probably relate to that sentiment. Never mind saving for college, you know. Uh, so there were certain elements in my life that I had an identity tied to uh, towards my double digit turning years, turning 10 or 11 or 12. I got really good with uh, working with my hands. Um, getting into remote control cars, uh, building them myself. So I got really good with that and had an understanding of how to use tools uh, to a pretty advanced extent. And then I got into an instrument. I've always wanted to play the drums. Um, (laughs) And I expressed that probably when I was eight or nine years old, or even seven. And, uh, hey, mom and dad, I want to play the drums. Okay, well, here's a saxophone. I played the saxophone for six months, and that was it. I was in the uh, elementary school band, tried that out, uh, and it just, yeah, it just didn't take. So I played the drums, age 12, finally got my first set of drums. And wouldn't you know it, yeah, it lined up with an identity. I was just meant to play, and I had a natural talent and ability to play the drums. And, and it became part of my uh, uh, identity in high in junior high school and in high school um wasn't really a popular kid uh moved into danbury high school in the 10th and 11th grade still not very popular but still finding my tribe if you will and i became that guy who hung with a lot of different types of groups i hung out with the jocks i hung out with the preps the the burnouts and the long hairs uh I, I was that guy. I was just kind of a cross pollinator in a way and uh, got along with everybody as much as they would get along with me. Uh, so I had that going for me. I became known a lot more towards my later years in high school as a drummer and, and, and a pretty accomplished one at that. In 11th and 12th grade, doing the talent shows, uh, you want to really boost one's self esteem. Uh, play a talent show when it, when your senior year and have uh, pretty much every girl in the high school screaming uh, for more uh, at the end of your set. That that was quite a night, and it's something that I always remember. So, yeah, graduate high school on time. Didn't stay back a year or anything. So hey, I had that going for me. Um, start going to college, right? 
in the beginning, college is uh, rah, rah, we're going to go. It's going to be all good. I'm going to nail this thing. Then you get into the reality of it. It's like, oh, this is a lot harder than I expected. And uh, other things happened. I got myself into credit card debt and, uh, you know, figured that not paying the bill was a a good way to handle things. So I I screwed up my debt, my credit early in life and uh, literally for seven years had to work around that and figure it out. Uh, In combination with that and dropping out of college and having to do a blue collar job with my father and working for the family business, it was... uh, quite a blow to the old self-esteem. Now, in college, I did have access to getting into radio, which I always thought was kind of a viable option for me, being somewhat of a ham and a creative. Went to the college radio station, uh, got myself a little bit involved. There was a little bit of a uh, country club attitude at the radio station at the college that um, you kind of had to work yourself into. I wasn't too much into that, but I did a couple of shifts here and there. And, you know, I always heard about how radio didn't pay all that well. So I figured, well, I want to get paid well. (laughs) Doesn't everybody. Um, Got out of, uh, you know, stopped with the the college thing. Got a full-time job selling patio furniture and pool tables. And uh, oddly enough, it was the first job I was fired from. On the day, uh, first day that I made a sale of significance of all things was the day that they let me go. Um, but you know, you look back on it and say, Hey, it's, uh, I- I've kind of been used to failure up until now. So this is just another part of it. And, you know, figuring out what my thing is and what my next purpose is going to be an identity. Then I just went to, uh, work with my dad doing phone system installations and selling them and learning that trade. Because I think he was just like, well, you know, if college isn't going to do it, then this will be the next best, best, best thing. If you want to take over the business, it's there for you. You know, come on board. I'll show it to you. And it's something I've always done throughout my youth and teenage years was pulling wire and things like that. Never really learned the intricacies, but I was about to be schooled on it by my dad, of all things. I don't know if you've ever worked for a family business, but yeah, they can be fun. So did that for a few years, got really good at it. And um, I was going into these white-collar establishments, law firms, doctor's offices, uh, school systems, and coming across people that went to college. And here I was, uh, what I perceived myself to be, a failure in college. I couldn't hack it. I didn't graduate. So I was relegated to doing what I was doing. Um, and my father once pulled me aside and said, Hey, listen, you don't have to look at it that way. You can actually look at it like you're the hero to the people that we're working for because they have a problem. They have a pain that only we can solve. Their phone isn't ringing or something's wrong with it. We are the heroes that get to go in there and show them how heroic we really are. And it was something that I always remembered. And I remember manifesting it in my head, but not feeling it in my heart because in my heart, I was feeling like I was a failure, um, that I was relegated to a life of, you know, just, just hating what I did. Now, my father got out of the business. I ended up, uh, not taking it over, but it got absorbed by a local, uh, electrician, electrical, uh, firm. And I started learning the electrical trade, oddly enough. And uh, working with other guys who went to Abbott Tech, the trade school I I referenced earlier. And they, you know, one one of my contemporaries, maybe who's a year or two older than me, so maybe 20, 19 or 20, about about 20, 21 at the time. And he was making, I don't know, 55 grand a year. You know, not bad for 1994, uh, five-ish. So that was my first eyebrow raise of, wow, that's pretty impressive that, you know, you're two years in, you're, uh, uh, you've gotten your journeyman's license, you're, you're heading up to being a master licensed electrician in another uh, five, six years. That's pretty incredible that you're making that kind of income 
because that, you know, at the time, that would be a dream income. So we move forward. Uh, I wasn't feeling the electrical field, uh, and I made it pretty well known. And at this time, I was getting into radio. I was. Uh, I decided to say, well, if I'm if I'm going to do something, I'm going to like what I'm doing. I'm going. I want to l- enjoy what I do, no matter what the pay is. And I know I'm not going to be paid very well in radio, so let me at least give it a try. So I went to a broadcast school, and wouldn't you know it, a lot of my talents and skill sets lined up with everything that they taught, and it was really something that. Uh, resonated with me and i was good at it i was able to voice spots and i wanted to be on the air i'm like oh yeah i'm 110 percent in you've got me how do we do how do we make this thing happen now there was a radio station locally where i used to live that i swore i would never work for at the time which is kind of funny because it ended up being my uh, proving ground my launch pad of sorts and I worked part-time as a production intern. Rich Conway, you probably remember that. He had me come on board as a production intern. Not sure if there was even a, uh, an actual position <laughs> for that type of uh, role. But, hey, it was an opportunity. It was a foot in the door. Uh, I was able to get my teeth cut and learn the business. Uh, and that's what happened. So I was kind of, you know, during the day being an electrician, And at night, I would go to the radio station and hang around the production room or the on-air studios, watch, absorb, uh, wait for the production guy to go home. Then I would sit down in his seat and play with all the equipment and learn it, figure it out, how to record my voice, all that stuff. Um, Interesting side note, while I was working for an electrician, there was a gentleman who was in charge of the company's traffic light division, and I had to work with him for a day. interesting conversation came up because it was a rainy day there was not much work to be done so we basically sat in the uh, cab of the truck all day talking and he was picking my brain about radio and i was telling him you know what i knew about how it worked and he says well what do you want to do i said you know i want to be on the air eventually and you know become full-time and do my thing there and and figure it out and he kind of snuffed or snarkled and i said okay you know what is that all about and we got into his background he was a uh a good contender to be a major league baseball player. And I said, well, what are we doing here having this conversation? What happened? Well, I blew my arm out. Doctor told me I'd never play again. Or if that I tried, I would cause further damage and it'd be irreparable. Oh man, that's awful. He says, yeah, especially when I had it looked looked at again. And if I had had the surgery back then, I would have been 200% stronger and would have been fine to play in the, in the majors, but I'm too old now. Oh, heartbreaking. Really uh, applied some perspective to what I was going through at the time, missing an opportunity like that. So later on, we uh, get back to the headquarters and we're getting out of the truck and getting, I'm getting ready to go up to the radio station. And then the same guy sees me and he goes, Hey, Jim. I'm like, yeah, yeah, what's up? You're never going to be on the air. And I kind of looked at him. I'm like, why, why the hell would you say that to me? I, I spent all day with you. Did I say something wrong? Did I piss you off? Or you're trying to piss on my Cheerios? What, what, what's going on? And I kind of looked at him and said, okay, whatever. And I went to the radio station. And oddly enough, long story short, that very night was my first time on the air. And I had a nice delicious moment the next morning when someone came up to me right in front of this gentleman and asked, hey, was that you on the air last night? And I got to look at the guy and say, it was. It was me. It was my first time on the air. So I don't know if he was trying to motivate me because there is a notion to motivating people by saying they can't do something or if he was just bitter about what didn't pan out for him. And it's one of those situations that I look back on and I say, you know, I I truly hope the guy found his peace and uh, was able to move on from that. But anyway, on with failure. So radio started panning out. I uh, spent three and a half years at that first radio station. I moved on to Vegas uh, for four years, which to me was a big feather in my cap because it was a medium to large market. And in that business, 
you get bigger and more notoriety and more marketability, the bigger markets you work in. And I worked for CBS radio, which was a big name at the time, big uh, corp company that worked for, uh, did very well out there. Uh, learned about the notion of entrepreneurship and starting a side hustle with uh, voiceover and started making money on the side to supplement my uh, full-time income. And eventually um, moved to Nashville in 05. Uh, in Vegas, we were able to buy a house. We had a very good life. Uh, it was basically being proven to me that you can make it without a college degree. It was being shown to me, no matter what, if you pursue what you're your, your, not your passion, your talent, your skill set, what really drives you. If you feel like you're getting up and you're not working, that's the thing you should be doing. Do that. So I was doing that. And I even got va uh, validated by uh, not a, a, a reunion formally. My sister-in-law at the time was uh, having a get-together with all the people we went to high school. Yes, she's, I went to high school when it was in the same grade with my sister-in-law and she was friends with a lot of the popular kids and um still is and one of the kids who was the valedictorian no 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 he was a class president that's right and we got to talking at this particular get together hey what are you doing now uh you know he was making a very good living uh, working for a car company um i was doing my thing and he said I said, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay money-wise, but I love getting up. You know, I'm every day, I enjoy what I do. And he just looked at me and said, man, I wish I could say that. He says, I'm still living in Danbury. Job pays really well, but I hate it. He said, dude, nothing is worth that. Life truly is too short. Um, but moving on. Getting to Nashville. Uh, won some awards out in Vegas. Won a lot more awards out in Nashville once I was in radio here. Uh, had our first child, bought our second house, which we're still in. So a lot of these things, it was my identity. It was what I was doing. It was what I was born to do in this season of my life. Uh, as things progressed for the next eight years, you know, money got tighter and tighter because uh, my wife and I were able to keep her home, which uh, at the time I didn't realize how big of a feat that was. And that was playing into the next phase of my feeling of failure. I got out of radio in 2013 because I needed to make better money. And I kind of hit my ceiling in radio, not understanding that if I kept on going with my side hustle and taking it a little bit more seriously, I probably could have accelerated where I am today to a certain extent, a much more significant extent. But if things play out for a reason, so the plan was to go out and uh, sell cars. One of my clients at the radio station was a uh, general manager for a local car dealership. And uh, said, hey, anytime you want to come on board and sell, you know, you could make over 100 grand doing this, and uh, we'd love to have you. You'd probably be great at it. You know, talk to my wife. What do you think? I'll be away from home a lot more, working weekends, but, you know, we kind of need it. So we decided to go ahead with it. Then out of the blue, in my two-week notice, about a week into it, a gentleman came into the radio station to record his spots. He was uh, a big local collision center here in Nashville, and he was the owner. Never met the guy, always heard his commercials. So we got to talking about all the different things and what my plans were. And he says, you know what you're getting into, right? I said, I have a pretty good idea. Yeah. He says, well, you, everything you do, video, writing, the marketing, the voiceover, the radio, is everything I've been looking for for my company. Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. You, you want to talk about that? Yes. Let's meet for lunch. So I met for lunch with him. Uh, came armed with a proposal of sorts. And put it in front of them. Hey, here's what I need to do. Uh, I really want to focus on your business. So in order for me to drop everything else I'm, I'm doing in terms of my side hustles and stuff like that, here's what I need to make. Big mistake on my part. Learning lesson. 
never, ever do that again. But he was able to meet what I needed to make. And it was a, it was a good salary. It was for, for what I was bringing to the table. And uh, first week in, uh, I think he fired like seven people. <laughs> I called my wife. Uh, yeah, let's uh, not spend any of that extra money. Let's just start putting it away. So that's what we did. Uh, always walked on eggshells. Uh, I, I enjoyed working for him directly. He and I, I think, worked well together. But, you know, if he just kind of felt like something wasn't working, he would just pull the trigger on you. So inevitably, two and a half year, uh, months in to working for him, and I put the car dealership on hold, he fired me. So firing number two of my career. Professional life, if you will. So, okay. I kind of got a little bit of a taste of uh, overcoming objections at this particular moment because I was like, hey, what the hell do I have to lose? Well, what is the problem? Uh, it's just not working. Well, what about it isn't, isn't working? Uh, it's just not moving the needle. Well, Bobby, we've been doing this for two and a half uh, months. How, what kind of movement did you expect? We're just on the precipice of getting this thing going. And part of what we talked about was to have me handle everything and have you save the 10% going to the agency and, you know, pocketing it. And I'll handle everything. I can do that. Is that something you want to move forward and do? I didn't realize I was trying to close the guy at the time. Now, did I close him? No. <laughs> I think I was meant to go into the car business. So here I am, tail between my legs. Hey, I know what I told you. I'd come work for you and sell Hondas. But, you know, this thing happened. It popped up out of nowhere. It was a good opportunity. And now it's not there. Would you still have me? I got to make a living of some sort. And I can't go back to radio because I already filled my position. And Steve Brink at Crest Honda said, yeah, buddy. Sounded like John Madden. Yeah, buddy, come on in, man. We'll, we'll get you going. Okay, awesome. Gave me a guarantee for a month, which was nice. And, you know, that started the whole car sales journey. And uh, so here we have it. Getting out of a business where I was an actual, a very big performer, very good at what I did, um, helped and part partook in teams that made some pretty big things happen in Nashville with radio. Uh, but just, it just didn't, you know, meet the needs anymore financially. So I had to do what I had to do, man. Let me tell you the first couple of months of selling cars was excruciating. Uh, I wasn't bad in the first couple of months, but I wasn't great. I was mediocre because I was figuring out what the hell am I doing here? Where, what, how did I get here? Are you kidding me? Never mind the fact that after the collision center job had ended, I had a, a harebrained notion to try my own thing on my own and just to hell with it all, do my own thing. But I felt like my wife even said, so now you got to do this. This is something that has to be done. So... Here we are. We're in the car business. And the first couple of months, like I said, was just, oh my God, it was, it was a grind. I, I went uh, an entire week without selling a car one time and it was just excruciating my, you know, you want to talk about mind to the games you play on yourself in that situation. Um, but let me tell you what I did get out of it. As soon as I started, I committed in my head to say, well, Jim, you're here. You might as well just put your nose into it and commit to it. Yeah, you could have done those other things and built your own business, but obviously it's not the time. Okay? So, make the best of it with what's in front of you. Okay. So I did. And uh had a met a lot of really good customers, amazing customers, had some doozies as well. But for the majority, a lot of them became um, friends. A lot of them I still uh, talk to today. And um, one in particular told me, he said, why, well, why, if you, he sold cars at one point and he got out of it and started doing his own thing. And he said, why don't you do, if you're going to do this, why don't you sell Highline, you know, luxury cars? And I said, I never, I never imagined myself. Self-confidence alert. I never saw myself selling BMW, Mercedes, Lexus, anything like that. He says, oh, dude, you'd be great at it. Really? What makes you say that? He says, because you got a good demeanor. You listen. You know, you understand the numbers of the business. You can do that. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for telling me that. So 
So the company I worked for owned uh, seven local dealerships, one of them being uh, a Mercedes dealership. So they had an opening. Reach out. I go to my manager, said, hey, I want to I want to give a, a shot at uh, Highline, and I'd like to move a little bit closer to home, <laughs> have better hours, make better per car, and have my Sundays off. Can you put in a good word for me? And they, they kind of hated to see me leave, which I appreciated because I made a lot of good friends up at the Honda dealership and met a lot of smart people. You, you want to you talk about some sharp people that work in that business. <clears throat> so long story short, I spent seven months at the Honda dealership. I moved to the Mercedes dealership at the end of 2013. I started mid month, which is, I guess, something you don't normally do. If you want to, you know, make a move in the car business, you kind of do it halfway through or, or, you know, month to month This way you start anew. But actually it was fortuitous because I had to learn up on the, uh, offerings that Mercedes had. So I looked at all the different offerings you know that honda had that i learned over the several months i was there and it was it was pretty you know good amount of information to understand and i moved into a highline german vehicle like mercedes-benz where it was just oh my gosh option city where you had it was just i don't know how i'm going to learn all the things about these cars but one of the most compelling things about being in the car business is the ability to say i don't know i'll check because they don't know you're bunk- you've become a monster yet apparently um but what I ended up getting in there, I got really good at the brand, uh, really good at product knowledge, uh, really good at telling the story, and ultimately really good at doing my own deals, closing my own deals, and applying a basic sales, fundamental sales process to what I was doing. And I learned so much from that. The psychology of sales, the nuances, I really got into it. And it was something that was just an awakening. An education, if you will, that I missed out in my 20s from not going to college to now experiencing it, experiencing it live with the fire under my butt that if I don't sell, man, things are going to get bad quick. So moving forward, did that for about a couple of years and um, got really good at it. Hated to leave, but things happened where I had to. Not because of anything that was wrong or anything. It was just uh, treatment from the company that was unsavory, let's just say. So during that time, I had a customer who was really, you know, they came, her, her husband and she came and they bought two cars from me. And they loved working from, for it with me. I mean, we really just had a good time. We hit it off really well. And, uh, we got to talking and I said, you know, I'm going to be 40 this year. And I said, it's really, it's really tough because everything I've, I've been doing, I feel like I've just failed, you know? And she sat there and listened to me and I said, here I am 40 years old. I've got no money in the bank. I've got nothing to show for it. I've done all this work over all this time and we're still living paycheck to paycheck. And she just stared at me, bewildered almost. And it was one of those conversations and responses that I'll never forget. She kind of just lowered her eyes and looked at me and she says, my gosh, you are so hard on yourself. And it almost like got me, I'm like getting choked up talking about it. I and mean, it almost got me then. I was going, you know, you're right. I'm not looking back at my path and seeing what has been built, I'm looking at the failure that I'm thinking I am and not understanding that I've, I've still got time left in the game. I can make changes. I still can adjust. And not only that, look what I do have. I have a wife that's able to stay at home with our children. On a single income, we pulled it off. That's not something you hear too much anymore these days. And she said, you're right. You need to remember that. That's why you don't have money in the bank to show for it. But look what you do have to show for it. Look at this journey in the car business. 
And what have you learned? So my point is, I moved forward with, uh, I got out of that. I went to another business for a short while. Doing what was familiar to me in terms of marketing, um, business development, selling. I incorporated a lot of the stuff that I learned over the past uh, 20 years into one job, including elements of the phone business, hearkening back to my dad. But it just wasn't me. I mean, it was kind of too, too little, too late. And I knew that the first couple of months I, I was into the job, that it you know, probably was going to be short-lived. So I started building up my side hustle again. I started getting more voiceover clients, more video clients, and saying, well, you know, in two to three years, um, I'm going to make a go of it on my own. And that's going to be the goal. And we're going to start turning this ship around and start putting money away in the bank and make actual goals. Because I've learned from my past. All the failures, perceived failures that have led me here have taught me one thing, one thing above all, how to fail. As parents, we're so afraid about our kids failing, bringing home a failing grade. A lot of my parents hang their own, a lot of parents I know hang their identity up on the performance of their children in school and their performance after school. So maybe they can put a sticker on the back of their car or shout to the world what university that their kids go to. There's an element of self-awareness that needs to be considered. Let your kids find out who they are. Because if you put them on a path that doesn't match their DNA, that can cause a lot of problems down the line. I don't tell my kids that they have to go to college. I say, if you want to go to college, I'm not going to stop you. I'm, I'm going to support you no matter what you do, but I want you to know why you're going to college, not just because it's expected of you, or you're going to get a, quote, good job because of it. Because I hope you, I've taught you that to be self-reliant, that no matter what, job or no job, you'll be self-reliant enough to be able to support yourself and your family doing something. I don't care if you mow lawns. I don't care if you're 25 years old and you go door to door raking leaves, flipping stuff on eBay. I don't care. I want you to be self-reliant and be able to do something that is able to support yourself. Because when inevitably those failures do come, it's going to be okay because you know how to weather them. In voiceover, in creative arts, we got to get used to a lot of failure, especially in voiceover. With everybody that's onboarding into this business on any given moment, it's a lot of competition. And we got to get pretty creative about how we put ourselves out there and still anticipate failure. If this is just a side hustle for you, that's awesome. That's awesome. Make it a goal in a couple of years to go full-time with it and figure out what it's going to take, the mini goals, to get you there. But understand that there are going to be a ton of failures on that road. A ton of them. Anticipate them. Learn from them. It's a great school. Never, ever be afraid of failure. If anything, crave it. Because it's going to make you a strong son of a bitch. It's going to make you really strong. Some failures can really destroy us. The good thing is, is that there's a good chance the next day you'll be able to wake up. Draw in a deep breath. Put your feet on the floor if you're lucky. And continue moving forward. The 
failures I've had almost make me proud. Or how I've felt almost makes me proud. Because I know a lot of people who haven't experienced failure. A lot of our kids in high school and, and things today, they win. They seemingly win. And it makes me afraid for when they actually graduate and life smacks them in the face. How are they going to be able to handle that? If you're a kid or you are going through failure, it's not bad. It's really going to work out. You may be one failure away from a win. I myself, I've auditioned on these websites, and I talked about this in uh, Blue Collar Voiceover Association. Make sure you join the group. Recently, I talked about my failures. People don't want to talk about it. I've been on websites that you have to audition to be on, which I think is a, uh, a good start. That if they think that the people at the website think that I'm good enough to be on their website, well, that's, that's a win. I'm still up against some pretty talented people. I'll be honest with you, I don't think I'm all that great as a voiceover talent. I know what my strengths are. I know what I can be better at, and I work on it every single day. But I audition every day, just about, for jobs, for the past two years about. I have yet to win one. But it doesn't stop me. Sometimes that win is just one audition away. That week that I went through a dry spell in the car business, every customer I got in front of, was a, a foul ball. I worked for two straight weeks every day. Bell to bell. By the end of that time, I felt like I was punch drunk. I was almost delirious, like I didn't know how to write up a deal, or at least a proposal of a deal, when I went to the desk. But I had that one that broke the dam. That one deal that all of a sudden, the dry spell was done. Guys, what I'm trying to tell you is that failure is a part of life. We all know that. It's cliche. But when you're going through it, you don't want to hear the cliches. You want to win. You want something to reaffirm your decision about going into whatever it is that you're going into and to show you that you're on the right path. If you believe that's what it is, keep on going. Do one more audition. Go out and shake one more hand. Or go out to another networking event and get in front of somebody. Treat the auditions as practice ground. How can you do it differently? Are you listening to them? Are you analyzing your work? Are you being your biggest critic? Because if you can't afford a, co a coach, which a lot of the elitists tell you to do, the reality is sometimes you just can't swing 120 bucks an hour for coaching until something happens, until you can cost justify it. We all get it. So you have to be your best and your biggest critic. Now, Will Stauff, who's a uh, contributing member here in the group, look him up. He's got a, a Facebook page or, or a group or a website that he had mentioned to me. And they'll rate your voiceover. Rate my voiceover. I think it's a group on uh, Facebook. But let him know. He'll probably be able to uh, provide clarity. So that is it. I've done an hour of uh, bloviating about my failures. And uh, my journey up until now, which has been, quite honestly, a lot of wins because I've, 
I think I've aligned my talents and my skill set. Finally, it took me 20 years. I'm kind of a slow learner and late to the party on a lot of things, including my own. <laughs> but that's how we learn. Guys, I hope you remember these words. Just keep pushing. If you believe this is your calling, learn how to get better at it. Keep on going. Do one more audition. Attend one more networking event. Find a B&I or something in your area to go out and shake hands and creatively earn that work. From a hand-to-hand combat marketing perspective, go out and find your work. Don't depend on agents or websites or P2P. Figure it out. Go out and get it. Old school. And I bet you'll find your win. You'll find something. So with that being said, this has been the JMVO Weekly Primer. Uh, I'm going to leave all the different uh, contact information in the description. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, Jim McCarthy, VOS at gmail.com and Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. You can contact me uh, there as well. If you like the podcast, give me uh, a rating. Five star, preferably. If you hate it, still rate it. One star. Tell me how much you hate me in the comments. That's okay. Share it with somebody. Um, anything. Because the podcast has kind of been cobbler's shoe scenario. I haven't exactly been putting too much effort on it lately. So it is what it is. But I keep on pushing. I'm going to try and do one more podcast. One more episode. You never know who you'll find. You'll never know who to get in front of. You never know who's, who, how your words will resonate with somebody that just needs that extra push. And I hope I've done that for you. So please subscribe, rate, comment, all that good stuff. Let me know if there are any topics I'm missing out on. And of course, join the Blue Collar Voiceover Association. Even if you're not in voiceover, <laughs> if you're in the creative arts, let's, uh, let's all get together and share some good stuff. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon. This is the JMVO Weekly Primer. Please subscribe, rate, and comment via JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com forward slash podcast.